Welcome back. I'm Justin Asiri. Normally on Beyond the Uniform on Mondays and Thursdays, we release uh, episodes primarily that, are, that interview military veterans about their civilian careers. So what they do, how they got there, and advice for other veterans seeking to do the same. And occasionally we'll do skills-based episodes where the person may not be a veteran, but they share some sort of insight or skill set that might help uh, military veterans in their civilian career. Uh, these Saturday episodes I use to go behind Beyond the Uniform, a little bit more free form, uh, a lot more monologue, and the um, general format I use is what I call the mullet format, so business up front, party in the back. The business up front is a mix of admin items as well as just some thoughts pertaining to professional life. Uh, that have come up this week or the last couple of weeks in interviews and email exchanges. Um, and then the party in the back is more personal, just kind of things related to more personal life. But if you've heard people talk about work-life balance, you'll realize that uh, those two are not that clearly defined usually. And uh, personal life tends to spill into professional and vice versa. So today, it's a little bit more about the business up front. I've got, uh, let's see, two or three admin items and then four professional items. We'll just dive right in. Um, so first of all, just wanted to give a quick uh, look ahead at what's coming up this week. Um, we have on Monday, episode 283 coming out with Justin Constantine, who was uh, shot in by a sniper in the head. He was declared killed in action, and he is still alive. Uh, He's had an incredible career since being in the military, and um, it's an extremely motivational and uplifting talk. So um, keep an eye out for that one on Monday. And then Thursdays, 284 with uh, Colleen Deer, who runs American Corporate Partners, which is an exceptional program for mentorship for veterans and members of the military. Uh, this will be our second interview with someone from their team. Um, have mentioned them on most inter- most uh, interviews they come up. So great organization. You'll get a good um, a good rundown on that. Wednesday, in between those two, I'm, I'm releasing, I just recorded it yesterday, but the sneak peek of a look at July's episode uh, lineup. So if you're curious about what's in store for the month of July, tune in on Wednesday. It's just a short 10, 15 minute episode where I talk through uh, what we have in store for, for the month of July. Um, one other admin item, this is a little bit more just technical. If you are a lover of spreadsheets, I love spreadsheets, um, then I highly recommend you check out a tool called Airtable. It's a startup that's raised quite a bit of money. And we switched over a couple months ago with Beyond the Uniform of using Airtable for a lot of what we do. So let me explain how we use it. I think that will give you a sense of some of what it's capable of, but it's a very powerful tool. So the way that we use Airtable for Beyond the Uniform is as we record episodes, we use Airtable as a online spreadsheet to keep track of them. That's what I'm looking at right now when I was thinking of who's coming up on Monday and Thursday. But we have a lot of different columns to track where these are at. There's a little checkbox for recorded and checkbox for the promotional text for the website and a checkbox for edited and a checkbox for the show notes being completed and the photo being completed. We've got a little spot to put the episode link and the video link and the emails of the people who were interviewed or that need to be notified when the interview's live. Now, what takes this further is Airtable integrates with a lot of platforms. So a platform that I really love is called Zapier. And Zapier is a brilliant technology that can interface with any two online technologies to do whatever you want. So the way that I use these two together is I spent a couple minutes setting up Zapier to integrate with Airtable. And now when I check that a interview has been edited, It automatically connects to my Gmail. It automatically looks at the column to see who needs to be emailed. And it sends a copy of the episode link as well as some templated email. But it looks like it's personalized. So it says, hey, uh, like for this Monday, hey, Justin, your interview is set to go live on June 24th. You can preview it here. Here's what the promotional text looks like. Let us know if you have any questions. 
So in that couple minutes of setting this up, it saves me in the course of a month a lot of time because I don't have to now manually email these people. Similarly, I, I after the any interview, I write down quickly the why to listen, which is what I start the episode with, and the about about the person I interviewed, and that goes into our website show notes. So I add that text right away to Airtable, and I, I have started working with a virtual assistant. I use another platform called Asana for task management. So as soon as I paste those notes in there, it creates a new, this is through Zapier again, it creates a new to-do item on uh, Asana. It notifies my virtual assistant. It includes all the relevant details. And then my virtual assistant goes into Squarespace, which we use for our website. She creates a new page for the new episode show notes. She pre-populates it with all the information. And again, that's something that used to take about 15 or 20 minutes of my time per episode, which really adds up in the course of a month. So I just wanted to give you a, a quick look. It's a, a really cool technology. We're just scratching the surface of it, but it's surface of it. But it's uh, it's it's interesting if you can think of anything that you do repeatedly on a weekly basis. It's Zapier and Airtable. Both might be tools that help you get rid of the stuff that's not higher level, that lets you do, as Cal Newport calls it, deeper work, more meaningful, intellectually stimulating work and can over time save you quite a bit of time. Um, and yeah, I think that's all I had to say on that. So the other last admin item is thanks to all of you who, for me, I'm recording this on Thursday. So last night on Wednesday night, attended our Amgen seminar. Uh, this was, we had 21 people, excuse me, actually 22 people joined throughout the course of it. About 45 people registered. It was great. It was uh, a diversity of input. It was the lineup was great because every you know diff three different services in the military, three different links of services, three different amount of time at Amgen, three different roles at Amgen. I think it provided an incredible holistic view of an industry and a specific company and different perspectives on transition challenges. Um, I think that, you know, based on that, it was successful. I think Amgen was very pleased with it. I was pleased with it. I think the audience was pleased with it. Already, the three panelists have talked about getting messages on LinkedIn. They're excited about that. So I'd like to do more of these. And just to let you know, we'll be doing some outreach to some more popular companies who might be able to um, speak about their company. As well, I want to try and do a format that's a little bit more skills related. So maybe someone like Amgen, rather than talking about Amgen, might talk about sales or marketing or something that would be more universally relevant. The other interesting insight, and I didn't realize this till Wednesday morning, I, I shot an email to, to Steve about this. One of the people who emailed me as a pa uh, seminar attendee in advance with a question was not a veteran. And we actually realized that there were a few of few people who weren't veterans on there, but were career transition people. And it's interesting for us to think of that, that the value of this audience could extend beyond the military community. And in the seminar, I tried to keep everything geared towards the veterans in terms of the content, in terms of the questions we took. But we did sprinkle in some non-veteran questions and just something uh, curious your thoughts on that, if that's off-putting for you. Um, I want to keep the, you know, obviously we're here for the military community, but it is kind of encouraging to see that people beyond the military can gain value. Um, one other item, I got to reach my backpack for this. Oh. I love to read. You probably heard me talk about extreme ownership on one of these episodes in the last month. Um, and highly recommend that book. Highly recommend doing it on audiobook and highly recommend doing it on audiobook through if you go to Beyond the Uniform's show notes, any one of them, you'll find a link to um, you will find a link to Audible, which Audible, which will give you a free audiobook of your choice, and um, through Beyond the Uniform. I, I looked yesterday. I think I have over a hundred audiobooks through Audible. It's just such a great way to plow through books that I otherwise might not read or have time for, and I can do that while running, while feeding my son Bodhi his bottle of milk, or by driving. Whatever you do, it, it's a little bit more dead time. So the book I wanted to bring up is also by Jocko Willink, who wrote Extreme Ownership, co-wrote Extreme Ownership, and this actually came to me. I'm doing this year-long men's program. They've got a long recommended reading list. 
and I saw Jocko's name on there. I was surprised and ordered it on Amazon. And it's a little bit more of a coffee table book, but it is called Discipline Equals Freedom Field Manual. And the reason why this resonated with me is that was actually, uh, I wrote, I'm looking at a post-it note on my monitor that is discipline equals freedom. It's a phrase that they used at the end of extreme ownership, and it really resonates with me. Um, I, I really, as we'll talk about a little bit, I really love my autonomy. And um, so sometimes I avoid discipline and structure, but I agree that the discipline and structure can bring a tremendous amount of freedom in the long term. So it's this kind of almost contradictory thought. So the way that this book works, and I'll read you a, an example, the book is, um, it's a little bit more of a coffee table book. The chapters are large font. They're not even chapters. They're kind of, it's its not even like a blog post. It's, um, as, as you'll see in the excerpt that I read, it's very short. Uh, there's usually like an image that goes along with it, but it's pretty motivational. I've uh, really enjoyed it. I'm about a third, maybe halfway through. And um, I can see myself revisiting this. I want to keep this in an area that's easily accessible, but it's a nice way. If you've heard anything from Jocko, he's extremely motivational, Navy SEAL. Um, it's the type of thing I want to have on standby to prime the pump when I may not feel motivated or to uh, persist when I don't feel like persisting. So let me see. I wrote down one of the ones I was going to read here. So... Okay, I'll just read you a portion of this one. This one was a little bit longer, but it's called Good. And again, this is from Discipline Equals Freedom Field Manual by Jocko Willink. Uh, so this one is called Good. He says, how do I deal with setbacks, failures, delays, defeats, or other disasters? I actually have a fairly simple way of dealing with these situations, summed up in one word, good. This is something that one of my direct subordinates, one of the guys who worked for me, a guy who became one of my best friends, pointed out. He would pull me aside with some major problem or some issue that was going on, and he'd say, boss, we've got this thing, the situation, and it's going terribly wrong. I would look at him and I'd say, good. And finally, one day, he was telling me about something that was going off the rails, and as soon as he finished explaining it to me, he said, I already know what you're going to say. And I asked, what am I going to say? And he said, you're going to say, good. He continued, that's what you always say when something is wrong or going bad. You just look at me and say, good. And I said, well, I mean it, because that is how I operate. So I explained to him that when things are going bad, there's going to be some good that will come from it. Oh, mission got canceled? Good, we can focus on another one. Didn't get the new high-speed gear we wanted? Good, we can keep it simple. Didn't get promoted? Good, more time to get better. Didn't get funded? Good. We own more of the company. Didn't get the job you wanted? Good. Go out, gain more experience, and build a better resume. Got injured? Good. Needed a break from training. Got tapped out? Good. It's better to tap out in training than to tap out on the street. Got beat? Good. We learned. Expected problems? Unexpected problems? Good. We have the opportunity to figure out a solution. So it's uh, pretty representative, just short little snippets like that. I, I liked that chapter in particular just because we all experience setbacks in personal life and professional life. And I love cultivating that mindset of seeing the positive and more importantly, seeing the opportunity in any challenge, problem, or setback, the opportunity to grow. So check out that book. Um, thrown out again, I've gotten one response, but the Beyond the Uniform Book Club could make that happen if you're interested. Maybe meet once a month, discuss books like this. If that's of interest, email me or hit me up on LinkedIn. Okay, so a couple um, professional items. The first one came out of last night's Amgen panel, and one of the panelists, Mariella, um, I actually have two points from her, but the first one was she pointed out something that I hadn't actually heard before in 293 interviews, and that was um, the sense I got was how little people understand about the military. In her experience, often when she shares that she served in the military, she talked about how she's uh, often experiences confusion and how many people, I know this is surprising, how many people she runs into who assume that only men serve in the military. And what we talked about uh, that, that's, that, that came out of that was using that as an example of understanding 
the gulf of experience that separates those who served and those who don't haven't. I've kind of used the example before where a lot of my good friends from business school, they will, even though I served in the Navy, I was on submarines, I uh, went to the Naval Academy, uh, they will introduce me to their friends as their army friend. And I know that, um, you know, we, we obviously see the distinctions between services, but for most people, they associate the military with the army. So these are just two examples that I wanted to use to highlight to just understand for you that when you're getting out of the military, if you've already transitioned, when you're sitting in front of a hiring manager or a colleague or even a potential friend, to not underestimate that, that there's a lot of uh, ignorance sounds like too strong of a word, but a lot of ignorance about what you have done, what this experience was to you. And to not be offended by that, but to also understand that there is a really big divide and that it is really incumbent on you to bridge that divide, to help them understand what your experience was, what your life was like. And in Mar Mariella's case, that's literally explaining that, yes, women can serve in the military, which is, is dumbfounded or it's, it's astounding. But um, I, I think it illustrates that, that gap between those who serve and those who haven't. Uh, a second thing that came up, uh, this came from Chuck Collinsworth, who was on the episode or on the show recently. And after he was on, there was an email exchange between myself, Steve Bain, Chuck, and a couple others um, from Lockheed Martin. And um, I just wanted to read a quote from it. And the gist of this was around something that um, Chuck talked on in the interview that one of the people on this email chain was pointing out how much that resonated. And um, it was the thought of how unexpectedly, how much the burden of responsibility grows when one is in the military and how many listeners may not be aware of that. Uh, he wrote in this email for me, the last 12 to 14 years of my career had been positions where you were literally on call 24-7 with the breadth of responsibility that meant it was not unlikely to get calls at 2 o'clock in the morning on issues, whether personal or operational. Realizing that I was no longer in that position, that my job was now contained to the 8 to 12 hours at work was incredibly liberating. I felt 10 pounds lighter and 15 years younger. Even my wife noticed this. And I know that uh, Steve shared similar experience in that email chain, but it was another point that I hadn't thought about a lot, which is um, especially as you become more senior in the military, but even I imagine as you're junior, you, you do have the, the weight of extreme responsibility, responsibility that could carry into dire consequences. And I think that we take that for granted just as we take many things for granted in the military, it becomes second nature. We're so surrounded by all of this that it doesn't seem that unique. But I think that this observation by Chuck is powerful because it's a good, again, a good reminder for you to be aware of that, that if you are currently serving, you may not realize the full weight and strain that that onus of leadership carries with it. And for those of you who have transitioned, you may not realize that that is something that you're recovering from, something that you're getting settled into and used to. So I wanted to point that out in case that that's relevant for you. And then the last one I wanted to share before I switch to the party in the back personal section is uh, comes again from last night's Amgen panel. And this one comes from Mariella as well. And I had asked her something along the lines of, um, understanding the values of a company so that you can figure out your cultural fit. It came from George, on the, who was a panel attendee, who asked that question about understanding cultural fit. And she pointed out that before you can assess a company's value, you really need to understand your own values. And I know that seems intuitive. It just hadn't occurred to me that, of course, you want to evaluate a company and understand whether their culture and values match their own. But the heavy lifting comes prior to that when, in reflection, you check in and you, re you understand what your current values are. I, I always think of this like email servers. If you use email, sometimes it will say you don't have any new messages. You'll see a couple 
and then maybe you have it set every five or 15 minutes to refresh, kind of goes up into the cloud, realizes there's more messages, downloads and alerts you. Those messages were always there, it's just they hadn't been checked and updated. And I view that with, with values as well. Sometimes we have values that served us earlier in life that over time through circumstances and through growth no longer serve us. And it's something I think that we have to do continuously. The, the values that I held in the military differed from the values when I was a few years out, which differ from the values I have now. And I imagine will differ from the values I have 10 years from now. Some of them persist, but some of them refine over time or change or evolve. And I think that's a powerful reminder for whether you're on active duty getting out or whether you've been out for 10 years, as you think of what's next for you in your career or in your life, it's always helpful to start with that reassessment of values. Uh, I have an interview coming out with Jan Rutherford. It's the second one that I have with him. And thanks to Airtable, I know that that is coming up on July 8th. We do talk about values in that. Uh, we have we had a coaching program with Beyond the Uniform, which is we, we don't have it on the website. It's still running because people are still using it, but we don't actively promote it. But I know that out of that coaching program, a recurring theme was um, the need to get clear on values. And an executive coach is someone with a skill set that can help you uncover those values and really drill into those. Um, but um, I, I just wanted to point that out as, again, something that hadn't occurred to me, but is really powerful. And, and my wife and I were talking about this yesterday where she had said when we were driving to dinner, she said, you know, one of your values, I think that might be your biggest value in work is autonomy. And I think she's right on that. I don't think I would have realized that even maybe three to four months ago. But one thing I really appreciate about the work life that I've compiled is the ability to um, control my schedule, control my location, control what I'm working on and who I'm working with. I really, really enjoy that autonomy. Uh, my wife and I were celebrating our seventh anniversary that's something i should probably know six or seventh anniversary in two days and we're getting away tonight for a couple nights to get out of town and i like that i can uh we're going to this hotel we really like about an hour and a half away i like that we can get away on a thursday night and friday night <laughs> before it's too crowded and before the rate goes up like i like being able to do that that means probably saturday and a little bit of sunday i'll do a little bit of work to catch up but i like being able to phase shift like that and that might drive someone else crazy. Someone else might like structure and rigidity and predictability. But again, you can imagine that knowing that value now, if I were to work on an, an organization, that would be one of the premium things that I would look at. Like, do they support autonomy? Do they allow remote work? Do they allow flexible schedules? Or is it very set in stone? It, it helps me in the consulting work I do. There's a client that I really like. It's a Fortune 500 client that I've done a lot of projects with. And they uh, um, asked me if I wanted to participate in another project, but it would require me to be online and available for a set period of time every day. And it makes it easier to say no to that because I know that doesn't fit with my values of autonomy. So those are the professional thoughts. Um, let me know your feedback on if this is helpful. And um, I'll transition now to the more personal side of things. And um, I'll speak more from the, the heart here. And we're all adults. I think we'll cover some adult material. So um, I'm assuming if you serve in the military, that won't be... Um, uh, won't be out of bounds. So uh, the thing that occurred to me was um, I was trading text messages with Steve and uh, we were talking about a theme that came up from Steve Cannon, uh, his interview. And Steve, thanks again to Airtable. His interview is going live on July 11th. Steve served as CEO of Mercedes-Benz. He's gone on to even more impressive things. But um he talks about in his final words of wisdom, and I think this is the snippet that I use for the opening quote for the, the episode, is about getting out of your comfort zone and how all great things in his career has come when he had the courage to step out of what is comfortable and, and to, to pursue something new. And that's, that's very consistent with my own life and what I've heard from other people on the show. So we were talking about that, about how great things come when you're willing to get out of your comfort zone or what's sometimes called the zone of proximal development. 
Uh, for me, I think of this actively when I'm applying to consulting projects. And I'm trying to cultivate this mindset where when I see a job where I'm confident I can do 80% of it and I'm not sure about 20% of it, stepping into that, knowing that that will cause me to grow stronger, that will cause me to get better, it will cause me to go deeper in my knowledge. Um, I'm sure you can think of physical examples as well. Last year, I did my first uh, first triathlon, which was a half Ironman in Tempe, Arizona. And the reason that I did that instead of starting with the shorter distance triathlon, a sprint triathlon was I knew that I could do a sprint triathlon. I knew that I would be easy. It would be easy to slack in training, but I didn't know if I could do a half Ironman. I, I knew that I couldn't do it without training. And so it was a step out of my comfort zone because I knew I would have to grow into that. I would have to become more to go deeper to achieve that. But I wanted to talk about a different aspect of this that I was thinking about the last couple of days since my text exchange with Steve. And that is the role that discomfort plays in our lives. Uh, So it's a little bit different than comfort zone, but it's related. And it makes me think of the ways that we numb ourselves to discomfort. So a few years ago, I had um, a stabbing pain in my right knee on the outside. And I ignored it for a very long time. Finally, I went to a chiropractor and I realized that my IT band on my upper quad uh, it was extremely tight. And he gave me a couple exercises with foam rollers to start to loosen up that IT band, start to let it relax so that my body could move in the right way. And I would stop applying pressure to my knee because everything in my gait was out of out of whack. And it made me think, like, thank God that I didn't just take aspirin, that I didn't just ignore or suppress that discomfort. That discomfort was my body telling me that something was wrong, something needed to change. And if I ignored that, I could have had a much larger injury. But instead, now I'm aware of that. It's something I continue to do. I'm looking at my foam roller as we speak, guiltily, because I have not done it in the last two days. Um, but, but again, this pain and discomfort can do a lot to motivate you to solve a problem. Discomfort can be your body or your life or your hearts or your emotions way of telling you that you are in a situation that you should not tolerate. Like I should not tolerate with that pain. I need to get to the solution. And so I I hope that makes sense, but it makes um, this next piece even more important. Knowing that discomfort is a sign that something is wrong or off. I'll, I'll actually use one other example. Um, I worked at a job previously. I, so I ran my own startup, still do, for for 10 years and joined another startup uh, last year and it uh, was not a good fit in many ways. And I, my body knew that before my mind accepted it. And there were many things that I disliked about it but I just kind of kept on going and that discomfort continued to build until I was forced to look at it and say, you know what, this is not the right fit. And again, that discomfort was my friend. That pain was a sign that something in my life was off, something that needed to change. I was, I, a phrase I use is I was out of alignment. I wasn't living in alignment with my values, with my purpose, with my calling. And um, that pain and discomfort was a tool in discovering that. And what's what's that quote? It's like, you will get what you tolerate. We get in life what we tolerate. And so at the point at which that pain becomes intolerable, usually that is when we take action to change a circumstance, to set something right, whatever that might be. And so it makes me think of, and I think about this a lot, it makes me think about what are the ways that I numb myself? What are the ways in which I have pain or discomfort in my life, and I artificially turn the volume down. I artificially tune that pain out. For me, this is not an exhaustive list, but it's it's probably the ones that came most to mind when I was thinking about this this morning. For me, uh, alcohol can be a way of numbing that. Just take you know take the edge off, right? Pot can be a way to do that. TV can certainly be a way to escape what's going on. Um, my phone 
man, the amount of uh, times I'm just sitting in line and I don't want to be sitting alone and not doing anything. So I'll pull out my phone and do something that is completely inconsequential, something that does not need to happen, but it keeps me distracted, keeps me numb. I think sex and masturbation can be ways to escape. That was the adult bit I was alluding to earlier. Um, sugar and food can be a way for me, right? I can eat, eat some sort of junk food. It makes me feel good in the moment, dulls that pain. Movies for me can be a really big escape. I love movies and nothing, there's, as you can see, there's, I don't think there's anything wrong with anything on this list, but I'm a big believer that the intention that you bring to an activity can make it good or bad. So there are times when I use my phone where it's great. I'm checking email on the go or I'm seeing what the directions are. And there's times where I can do the exact same thing, but my intention isn't to be productive. My intention isn't to get something done. My intention is to escape. Movies can be great, but again, am I doing that for entertainment or am I doing it to escape? And so I bring these up just to kind of highlight for you, maybe some of these are in common for you and and to give those a hard look. And, and the reason why... I think this is so important is if these things numb us to this pain, if they deaden us to the discomfort that we are feeling, we're going to tolerate them longer. We're going to take tolerate them longer than probably we should. We'll sit in a situation, a relationship, a job, a location longer than we really need to because we're stretching it out. We're deadening that pain, that pain that I believe our body or our soul or our mind or something is telling us this isn't right. Again, with my knee, if I had been just pounding aspirin, how much longer would I have gone before I realized that there was something wrong, something I needed to fix? And so I've, I'll share a couple experiments that I've done. And again, I think that this is very personal for each of us. What you find numbing, I might not, and vice versa. And what I do to address that may connect with you or it may not. But I just share this more as examples for my own life in case that, that's helpful for you. So um, a, a couple years ago, I did a year without alcohol or without pot. And then I, I kind of experimented again with both of those for a little bit of time until about um, just under a year ago, kind of went into that again and, and most likely for good. And the reason why was the um, realization that both of those things are very easy for me to numb out. And both of those things are, are more alcohol than pot, but are things that are difficult to exclude from me in moderation. Like it's hard, like it's easier for me to say, I don't do this. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to think about any rules around it. It's just something I don't do versus, oh, I'll have one drink a month or when it feels right. Just that, that for me just is a slippery slope. Uh, the one exception, my brother is still serving in the Navy when he gets out uh, eventually at his 20 or 22 year point. That may be a, a chance when I need to reevaluate the whole pot thing and maybe take one day off to, smoke the world's fattest joint with him in celebration. Um, but that's the one exception I can think of. And, and who knows, you know, I, I think this is, um, it kind of goes back to that discipline equals freedom book. It's, uh, he has this thing of like, when you feel like you need a day off to not take that day off until tomorrow. And usually when tomorrow comes around, you don't actually need it, but like not giving in to the, in the moment exceptions for ourselves. And so I think of that with alcohol and pot. It's like, yes, right now in my life, this is true. And if I feel like it's not true, I'm going to let that sit for a few days, few weeks, few months. I'm going to talk about it with people in my life that I trust. And then if it still holds true, I can change that. And there's nothing, uh, there's no law about this for me, but it's something that I know is right and better for me. It's something I'm doing with sugar right now. Again, that's one where when I try to restrict this to, oh, just occasional I'll have dessert or things like that, it just it comes in waves. And so I'm just kind of completely eliminating it right now. And, um, you know, there's different ways to to do that. For me, it's not like uh, I've done like the Whole30 diet where it's pretty strict. You don't even have ketchup because ketchup has sugar in it. Um, it's not to that extent, but it's like the things that trip me up, like having dessert or grabbing a treat from Whole Foods or whatever else. It's just easier for me to eliminate that. Um, and then my phone is one where I just realized that's an unconscious habit I have that whenever I'm bored, whenever I want to escape, 
Uh, the phone is right there in my pocket. It's pretty easy to find something somewhat interesting. I can shop for something on REI. I can se- check out the newest movie ratings. I can check email. And um, so through this men's group, we have accountability partners. And that's the one I'm working on this week where I'm trying to set it aside for an hour a day in the evening uh, with the intention of having more time to connect with my son and my wife and just completely turning it off, putting it out of range and um, checking in with him in a couple weeks to see how that's going and what to do differently. So I give those all as examples of things that you might want to try, but also as an example of that accountability partner, it can be a lot easier to have someone else. Uh, I have another accountability partner where every morning, we've done this for over a year and a half now, every morning we text each other with an intention for the day, as well as one thing we're grateful for, because we both want to lead more intentional lives, and we want to lead lives that are more full of gratitude. And so that's a way that really helps me. And there's many days where I forget, and then he texts me, and it reminds me, and I think of it, and I respond. And so it can be more helpful to do this with someone else. Um, So that's all for today. Check out Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday's episode, and have a wonderful weekend.